Okay, hopefully uh, I am live and you guys can see me now. Sometimes it takes half a minute or so for you to see uh, what I am saying. So Pam, I see Pam is there, so that's good. Um, so uh, will it probably take a couple minutes uh, for people to uh, show up? I'm just going to check and see if anyone's here. We've got maybe six people here right now. So uh, if you guys have questions, you can ask uh, me anything you would like. Uh, I'll, I have a few questions that were left over from the last live stream or people missed the live stream and left questions in the comments. And so I thought I could start off by answering um, those things as well from india welcome oh my goodness <laughs> midnight in in uh in india oh my goodness although i think sometimes you guys have like you're off by 15 minutes or half an hour the time zones are a little different there hi everyone it was mary sung pak from chicago rebecca michigan all right hello everyone so I'm going to just um, start off with a couple of questions and then as you guys have them, you can um, fire them away and I'll be scrolling back through um, to see them. So my camera's right here, <laughs> my monitor is down here, and the questions are over to the side. So my eyes might be wandering a little bit as I um, see everything. Belgium. Oh, good. I'm so glad I'm getting people from uh, outside the U.S. I was hoping this time would work a little bit better. So um, the past couple of weeks, I was talking about, I think it was a Technique Tuesday video where I was explaining how you could use multiple um, strands of yarn together to create a thicker yarn. And somebody had a question about, uh, do you think it's best to ply the yarns we com combine? So what she's talking about is either using a spindle or a, sp or a spinning wheel to take those two balls of yarn and then plying them together as a yarn before you knit with them. You could certainly try that, but it's not necessary. A lot of times if people are using two strands of yarn, they're just using the, the two ends of the same ball of yarn. If you have a center pole ball, you can just use both ends and knit with them. And one of them is going to be um, kind of winding itself around. They're going to wind themselves around each other uh, as you knit, but there's no real need to actually ply those two strands of yarn together. Although it would be an interesting experiment if you have the equipment to try that and see and do com comparison, do one swatch where you don't do that and one swatch where you do. And, and you could compare um, if the yarns, if you are a spinner and you know about S ply versus Z ply, a commercial yarn is usually has an S ply. Um, if once the two are, are plied together, and if you were going to ply those two together, you might try doing a Z ply, and then doing an S ply, and see if uh, you can compare the difference between those two. So let me, I see a lot of you, I see things um, swirling by the chat. So I'm going to see if there are any questions. Oh, we've got Oslo, Oklahoma, Quebec, Florida, Egypt. Oh my goodness. Trevor from Spain. I love it. Okay, so Pamela says, I was wondering what my favorite go-to worsted weight wool is. I used to use Cascade 220 a lot because the yarn shop where I used to teach and I got 25% discount. <laughs> uh, it was just a few blocks from my house and it was one of the best yarn shops in the Twin Cities. And that was the, most yarn shops have kind of a, a basic worsted weight wool that they carry. And Needlework Unlimited carried a lot of Cascade 220 and then they started carrying Ella Ray and those two are really interchangeable. What I have over here on my wall right now are a few different things. I have a few sweaters worth of worsted weight uh, yarn and it's because I, I went to shops outside of the Twin Cities or when I was in Santa Fe. Basically, um, anything that gives me, uh, that has, I prefer four plies over three in general for some reason, um, but three or four ply worsted weight wool 
um, with about 220 yards um, per 100 grams, I know what that is going to act like. And those basic worsted weight wools tend to come in a gazillion colors. So I'm not too, too fussy about that. One of the things that I have been experimenting with though is this um, brown sheep. It's a company here in the United States. Um, they have what's called like a vertical manufacturing system. So they have wool from the Western United States that's brought there to their mill and they, um, they process everything um, there. And their worsted weight wool um, has three plies, but it's like a, it, it's, it's kind of rounder and fluffier and it feels like it's thicker but there's more yardage and it's been really intriguing me and that's the yarn that they also have a fingering weight so i just bought that recently to experiment to you to see if it'll work for my traditional uh, dutch sweater or not dutch a danish sweater that i'm going to be working and so this brown sheep yarn is the one is that that kind of well it's right here it's this blue yarn that i use a lot um, in my videos um, when I do my overheads because it shows up so well on camera. I have, have, have it in a lot of colors and I've just, it shows up really well in this medium blue or green color. Um, and I just use it for swatches and then I'm like, you know, I really like this. And, and so I want to try doing some actual projects with that, but I'm probably going to start with the fingering weight yarn. So let's see. Um, Somebody said that she almost always uh, mul uh, knits with multiple strands and doesn't have the ability to apply. Where am I located? I am in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is in the upper Midwest. They call it the Midwest. It's like right in the center of the country, but up at, near the border of Canada. But I'm in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's our major metropolitan city in this state so i live in the city limits i don't live in the in the suburbs so um and it's beautiful beautiful spring day today yesterday was 65 degrees fahrenheit beautiful unseasonably warm uh, weather that we've had so it's just beautiful okay Pakistan. I can't believe how many countries. <laughs> uh, can I do a show and tell of all my knitted sweaters? What I'd love to see a whole pile of them. Uh, I can't do it right now because <laughs> um, they're in various places. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about doing this spring because it's springtime and you can see I'm not wearing a sweater now is wearing a zip up sweatshirt and I've just taken it off because it's kind of warm. Um, so it's about time for me to wash my hand knit sweaters. So I was thinking about showing you guys my process. It's very easy <laughs> for how I take care of my sweaters and wash them before I store them for the summer. Because if they're clean, then you're, you don't have to worry so much about things like moths. Oh, Rebecca was heartbroken when Needlework Unlimited, where I, where I used to teach. Yeah, it was, it was too bad. Uh, in my vintage knitting research, have I ever come across double crepe wool? If so, what might it be? Um, I've heard of crepe yarn, and I've, I read something recently. There is a, a dictionary of textiles um, that was published in about 1919-ish, somewhere around there. That was the first edition, and then it has been updated um, multiple times over the past hundred years and they have what it was and you can get it on archive.org so if you go um, on um, the internet and you type in archive.org um, then you can um, search for various uh, reference books of different types but if you if you search on dictionary of textiles and it was, I can't remember the guy's first name, it was something like Lawrence or something was his first name, but it's the edition that was published in 1919. And if you go through there, they define all of the different types of yarns. And so that was something that I found was really helpful for understanding the vintage yarns. It gives you an indication at least of what the fiber type was. And then sometimes, 
you can Google around and if there's a specific brand, like if you're looking at a, a pattern that was produced by a yarn company, sometimes people will have color cards or actual yarn that you can see um, online to see what that looks like. Excuse me one second. It's spring here and my nose is running. I'm all, um, I think all of the pollen is in the air. So, um, so I'd look in that dictionary textiles and see if you get some some clues there. Hello from Israel. Um, let's see. Is there a rule for knitting or slipping the first stitch of a row? Uh, well, my rule is I hardly ever do it. <laughs> Mostly because if I'm seaming, I don't want to slip the first stitch. Um, because when I seam, I use mattress stitch. And when you slip that first stitch of the row, it can make a really nice edge if the edges are going to remain exposed later, like if you're knitting a scarf or a blanket or a shawl or something like that. Frequently, instructions will call for you to uh, slip the first stitch of a row, and that's to create a nice looking edge. But if you're going to seam, and if that seam is going to be a mattress stitch, that slip stitch can kind of mess with the tension of the second stitch. So the edge stitch is going to be hidden in the seam. You're not going to see it. I mean, yes, it's going to look nice on the inside of the garment, but that second stitch, the one right next to the seam, is going to be on the outside of the garment, and it, it's going to look a little wonky um, if you slip that stitch. Sometimes, I, if I remember, I will slip the first stitch of a row when I'm doing like a garter stitch edge. And it's only sometimes it really it, it part of it is I have to remember I did a vintage sweater last year that was from 1938 and the pattern did not say anything about slipping the first stitch of, of the row and I didn't think about it and once I got the button band done I thought that does not look good and then I looked at the photo of the pattern and I could see that they had slipped the first stitch of every row and so I took out, uh, I re I re knit that uh, piece of the front and did that slip stitch. So, um, other than that, if you're working in something like garter stitch, typically when you finish a, a knit row, the yarn is in back, and so you turn the work and then the yarn is in front. You slip the stitch and then you move as if to purl and then you move the yarn to the back and that will create that twisted chain. There are a lot of different ways of creating uh, the same effect um, at the edge. Some people will slip the last stitch and uh, purl the beginning or knit the beginning. There are a lot of different ways. So one thing that you could do is um, do an experiment and knit a little swatch and write down what you're doing because you can kind of forget what you're doing and try different methods um, using whatever stitch pattern that you are um, using. Usually it's it's something like garter stitch if it's going to remain exposed later. Somebody has got some novelty yarn, it sounds like from a kit um, for a mini bunny. I don't, I don't like novelty yarns and sometimes it's the perfect effect for whatever it is you're doing, but I don't have a whole lot of experience with it. So I don't really have any uh, tips for it. Uh, if it's really slippery, my only tip would be to use a bamboo needle rather than metal needles. I, most of the time I really prefer metal needles because they're nice and slick, but if I'm using a slippery or hard to control yarn, then I will want something that has a little more drag on it. And so bamboo is going to have a little more friction. Um, so oddly enough, uh, bamboo yarn, which is very slippery, I like to use with bamboo needles, which are not <laughs> as, as slippery. Oh, Invergrow Heights in Minnesota. Uh, hello. Um, do I like to knit with straight needles or circular needles? Yes, I do. <laughs> I knit with uh, straight needles when I am going to throw uh, with the yarn with my right hand. So if I'm knitting something that's going to be flat in stockinette, I prefer to uh, knit with my long straight needles. They're 14 inches and I anchor it at the junction of my hip and thigh and I'm not holding that right hand needle, it's just held there and I can touch it, but I get the most perfect 
stockinette tension when I knit that way. And that was the way I learned to knit and I knit that way for 20 years. And I learned continental knitting um, in order to knit socks and knit hats and things in the round because that method of knitting didn't work very well with circulars or double points because the tips were so much shorter. I had to hold them down close to my uh, hip and it just wasn't comfortable. And I was not able to modify the way I knit with the yarn in my right hand. It was a lot easier for me to learn a completely new knitting style with the yarn in my left hand and then try all kinds of things with that than it was for me to alter the way I knit with the yarn in my right hand. So my 1920s vintage sweater that I've, you know, on hold right now because I'm taking a tiny little break from it, that I was knitting on long straight needles and it's been a while since I've done that. The Aran sweater I'm working on right now I am working on a circular needle. So most of my projects I knit on a 32 inch circular needle. I have an interchangeable set, but pretty much I only ever use the cables that create a 32 inch um, needle. And if I'm knitting socks, like I am right now, I'm knitting a pair of socks for my daughter right now. I, have, I use a 32 inch circular needle and I use the magic loop technique. If I'm knitting a hat, uh, that's about 20 inches in the round. I use a technique called traveling loop where you only have one of these loops and it stays in between the last stitch of the round and the first stitch of the round. And you just knit all around as if you had a regular circular needle that would work for something that size. And then when I get up to the crown of the hat where I'm doing decreases, then I end up shifting to magic loop. So I knit, when I knit flat, most of the time, I'm knitting on a circular needle. When I'm doing swatches for uh, the overhead shots for my technique videos, I'm usually knitting on a set of double points because they are a nice short length. And um, if I use circulars for that, the, the uh, cable will droop down on the table and make noise and thump. So I've just found that for that situation, then I use double points. I hardly ever use double pointed needles for my knitting projects because I can't keep track of a full set. So, so I, well, keeping track of one circular needle works for me. Is there any trick to choosing yarn for color work? All my choices seem to not relate well and look odd. Okay, you're talking to someone here who's slightly colorblind. Um, the trick that I use, usually if I like the colors, um, if I think they're pretty, other people will too. My my bigger problem is worrying that something is ugly, but if it looks ugly to me, it may not look ugly to somebody else, but then I don't want to knit with it. My main trick though with working with picking colors for stranded color work is to put all the colors next to each other. I have I have some uh, yarns right here. These are the some of the Shetland yarns. So you'd put them all like on the table. And then you take your, your camera, your phone camera out, and you set up the filter that, that says black and white, and you just look at the colors. And so any two colors that you were planning to, to use together in black and white, if they look different in black and white, they'll work together. There'll be enough contrast between them uh, when you are knitting. But if they're very close, if they, have, uh, if, if they look the same in black and white, they have what's called the same color value. And even if they look really pretty next to each other, when they are alternating in a row, it's going, you're not going to see the pattern. It's just going to disappear. There's um, a really nice book on stranded color work. Uh, I'll go get it. It's on my, my shelf over there. And yes, I'm wearing pajamas, my pajama bonnet. So this is the book. It's called uh, The Art of Fair Isle Knitting. And it's by Anne, I'll put that up the, so you can see, Anne Feidelson. And she has a section in here on um, color work, on, on showing the principles of color. So you can see the swatches in here, how some of them, you can see the colors, like they work, and then some of them they don't. Like some, the one... Um, Ah, the one on this page right here, you, it, it's just muddy. You can't really uh, see it very well. So I, I really recommend that book um, and some of those books on, on color theory. But otherwise, I'm terrible at picking colors. I can usually pick three colors that I feel confident about, and then I start asking 
the clerk in the store. Or I do what I did in this case and I order yarn online in like a kit format <laughs> if it's more than three colors because then I know the colors will work together. Let's see, would using smaller needles use more yarn than a bigger needle if the number of stitches was altered to make a piece of the same width as required. Okay, so here's here's how how let let me give you an example. Let's say you're going to work something 10 inches wide or 10 centimeters wide, whatever, but the unit is 10. It's going to take the same amount of yarn to work one row. Whether it is thick whether it's you know big needles or little needles, you're going to have more stitches if you have thin yarn with little needles. Um, then, then you, and you'll have fewer stitches if you have a thicker yarn and bigger needles. But each row is going to take the same amount of yarn. Now that can change a little bit when you get into those super bulky yarns, with, which are so thick that that the width of the uh, of the stitch itself kind of can alter things a little bit. Um, but in general, fingering weight to say bulky weight, you're going to use the same amount of yarn per row. But you have fewer rows per inch when you are using a thicker yarn um, than you are when you're using a finer yarn. So you're gonna every row is gonna have the same amount of yarn, uh, but you are gonna have uh, if you are working something that's 10 centimeters long or 10 inches long, it's gonna take fewer yards for the thicker yarn. If you're using the same number of stitches. And so the width is different, but you're using the same number of stitches, uh, you're going to use um, more yarn for the thicker yarn because every stitch is going to actually be bigger. So that can get a little tricky to try to figure things out. So when you're trying to scale things up or down, um, if you're trying to keep something exactly the same size, you will use less yarn uh, with a thicker yarn than you will with a thinner yarn. But once you get outside of that, then it's a little more complicated to try to figure out. Have I ever seen any vintage pattern books specifically for men during your research? There are usually garments for men. The sweaters tend to be really sort of basic and plain. They get a little bit more interesting, just like the women's sweaters kind of get more interesting in the 50s and 60s. That's just sort of the the heyday of, of uh, sweaters and fashion was in the mid-century, so they get a little better, but men tend to be notoriously, you know, simple in their preferences. They don't want something kind of fancy and different. They want, but there, but there certainly are, are uh, things for men. Um, and one of the, the sweaters I was considering doing for my 1920s was actually a man's sweater with the shawl collar. The shawl collar sweaters for men, even though where they were plain stockinette, sometimes they may have had a, like a, a brio, plain brioche or they might have had some cables. Uh, but they, I love those early 20th century men's sweaters because the shawl collar construction they don't use that anymore and that and the construction of it and the utility of it is amazing but yes most pattern books they kind of like today's pattern books where sometimes you'll see uh, a man's sweater or two in them but they it won't be just focused on men's sweaters but there if it's a if it's a big book it'll have things for babies it'll have blankets and shawls it'll have socks it all gloves and it'll have uh, sweaters for for everybody in the family and certainly these 1940s books that I've just recently bought from the UK a lot of the titles are um, practical family knitting or it's it does have things for for men in those books could I do a video or recommend a source for converting a pattern from drop sleeves to set in sleeves Um, the armhole isn't too, too different for a set in sleeve. The trick is always with the sleeve cap and, um, well, it's not too different from a modified, um, set in sleeve where you bind off some of the stitches, 
and then you go straight up that's a modified drop shoulder and a satin sleeve isn't super different it just has some cap shaping so basically the way you would convert that is to calculate how to do the sleeve cap so the easiest way to do something like that would be to use a book like Ann Budd's um, let's see like this book uh, the knitters handy book of sweater patterns and so she has all the different kinds of construction techniques and they're done by gauge and so if you had a particular sweater that you really liked and you just wanted to change that um, the the sleeve then you could look and see how that sleeve cap was shaped to make sure that your underarm uh, your armhole depth was matching up to uh, whatever was in here and that would be a way of doing it um, um, if you're doing things top down and you pick up a lot of times I knit a sweater from the bottom up to the shoulders and then I pick up st stitches around the armhole in order to do a short row a set in sleeve down and there are some formulas for that and there are a, a few different formulas for that um, Barbara Walker's knitting from the top is uh, one where um, where that was first shown in contemporary times it's they, they did it back in the vintage stuff they didn't pick up all of the stitches at once and then do short rows they started with just the sleeve cap and then they would pick up a few more turn a work back pick up a few more so they would kind of pick up and do short rows as they went and they used a formula as well I don't know that they fit as well as one that's done bottom up and actually shaped but but there are formulas out there um, to do that um, did I find any interesting stories or info about men learning to knit during World War One and Two? I've read about men being taught to knit in hospitals and boys learning to help the war effort, and I love it. I think really everybody was knitting in World War One, in particular, they were knitting socks. Um, and in public, every you know, you were expected to be knitting. Um, I mentioned this in Casual Friday uh, video, and I put a link in that description in the video that the World War I, the National World War One Museum here in the United States um, is doing um, a lecture on May 2nd. It's um, next next Saturday uh, at 10:30 Central Time, and you can RSVP on there, and then they'll they'll send you a link, and it's free to do that. You have to like create a login ID and tell them your email address and then they'll send you a link but you don't have to make a donation or be a member of the museum although they appreciate donations but they're going to have a lecture about knitting that has to do with World War One, and I can't remember the name of the topic um, and I don't know if they're going to have a way since it's going to be a virtual thing for people to ask questions so you that would be one way that you might be able to um, find out more about that um could i chat about the difference between worsted and woolen spun yarn pros and cons to both do i have a preference does one hold up better um i until i learned to spin i mean i took a class from clara parks a few years ago and that was one of the things i talked about was woolen spun and worsted spun and i and I just didn't really get it until I was learning to spin and then I kind of saw how um, the fiber was prepared differently, especially in hand spinning. Um, they do some very similar things with commercial mills. They can't do exactly some of the things that a hand spinner could do in terms of hand um, combing um, fibers. They do, they do it by machine, but... Um, so worst, most commercial yarns are going to be worsted spun. Um, and that's a very smooth, it has the plies, they're very smooth, and they're plied together. There's an, often three or four plies. Um, woolen spun seems like it's usually two ply. I mean, I don't know why you couldn't do it three or four ply, but I think one of the things about a woolen spun yarn is that um, it will fill out, it will bloom, and maybe the, and you get less stif, stitch definition with woolen spun. So the, the difference between the two is, if you want to think in general terms, is that when you have the fleece, the sheep's fleece, 
and you have to prepare it for spinning, you can either comb the fibers and line them all up in parallel and then you can kind of gradually elongate so that you separate them so you only have a few fibers at a time together, but they're all overlapping um, this way. And then you um, twist them together. So that's how you're creating the thread. And, it, and the way that you do this, you draft out the, the fibers, um, well, is part of what determines how smooth that that single is going to be. Some of it's how the fiber is prepared and some of it is how it is spun. So most commercial yarns are that are like applied yarn are going to be uh, worsted spun. The woolen spuns um, are much uh, rarer uh, amongst commercial commercially manufactured yarns. Um, a friend of mine was telling me that the people, the, the woolen spun yarns you find tend to be produced by designers. And so Brooklyn Tweed is one designer who has yarn who has both woolen spun and worsted spun uh, yarns. And on his website is a very, very nice uh, explanation of not only the whole process, but showing you in their yarns what that looks like. So a worsted spun yarn is going to hold less air. It's going to be more compressed and more smooth. It's going to be great for things like st stitch definition. So if you like to do cables, it's going to be great for that. A woolen spun is really nice for color work. That's why the Shetland wool, like the, the, the yarns that they have for those, uh, uh, for Shetland sweaters tend to be woolen spun yarns. They, they do create some, or they tend to be, yeah, woolen spun. They do have some worsted spun yarns, but the, the ones like I'm doing with my hat that I did, which is uh, behind me on the in a bin. Um, when you wash those fibers, they kind of bloom and they kind of blend together and it looks a little more painterly. So you can do color work with worsted spun, but then the stitches are very, each is very, very defined and separate. And the woolen spun yarns are stickier and they're going to work really well with stranded color work. But that doesn't mean you can't use one for the others. A woolen spun is going to be warmer because it traps more air. The fibers are more disorganized. Um, uh, but you're not going to get as good st stitch definition and it's probably not going to be as hard wearing. So uh, sock yarn tends to be uh, worsted spun and really tightly um, plied as well and that makes it harder wearing. Uh, hi from Edina, just a few blocks from me. Um, let's see. Can I think of why your German short rows leave a hole when you go from pearl to knit? I don't have an issue from knit to pearl. I do not know. I know that things can look wonky if you've been working back and forth in your last and then you begin working in the round, then all the ones that are on the right hand side cannot, on the right edge can look not as nice as the ones over on the left. Um, you, I'd have to see a picture and see, could be you're pulling too tightly or maybe too loosely. I don't, I don't, I would need to see what you were doing. Um, let's see. I am a guy who knit a 1942 copy of World War II Army Gloves, American Red Cross pattern. It had to go up several needle sizes. I think they had smaller hands back then. Um, could be. Um, or I don't know if, if they had the gauge listed. You know, so that, that can uh, vary as well if you weren't getting the gauge that they were um, calling for. Let me look. I'm looking for some more questions. Um, have I shown how I weave in ends when color work is sparse? Like my last vintage. Oh, like for Intarsia. Um, I haven't. Um, you know, and it, it, it depends on if you have a, yeah, like a big block of color versus something that's a little bit of a line. Let me think if I can 
I don't know if I'll be able to show you the back of that sweater. One second. Um, so you can, so if you look at, this has got um, some uh, larger blocks of color and then some that are just like diagonal lines. So what I do on the back, so the blue is just like a V, is I tend to kind of skim through the backs of the stitches, the blue stitches, um, like on the line of stitches, because you can't go along the, the horizontal row like with reverse duplicate stitch like I would do if the whole, if the yarn tail was the same color as, as the stitches were. Um, so I tend to just like, like take a sharper needle and I just split through the backs of the stitches in the, in the area where I had worked those stitches. I have not done a video. I was intending to do it and then I, then I forgot. So, um, I still have quite a few ends to weave in on this. Um, so that's a, a good idea uh, for a video. When doing stockinette stitching, I don't have any rowing out, but some stitches on the right side look a little funky. Uh, do I know why that would happen? And I guess it would depend on what you mean by funky. Um, uh, I don't know if you mean like sometimes they look a little zigzaggy, or if you mean that sometimes the stitches don't look like these. So... I think the, the zigzaggy nature, like if you are working flat and then you switch to working in the round, even if your gauge is exactly the same, sometimes the stitches can look a little bit different, especially when it hasn't been washed and blocked yet. And I think that has to do with just the direction that you're knitting. If you're always, um, if you're knitting back and forth, that might cause a little bit of tilting back and forth. And it's probably in combination with the way the yarn is is twisted as well when it when it's plied together. Um, if you're talking about stitches that look sort of like some, one of them is straight up and one of them is angled out like that, like your stitches look like that, they don't look like these, um, that has to do with the way the yarn is plied. Um, uh, and there's a good article on Knitty and the Knit and Knitty's magazine and it's called, I think it's like, um, why ply something like that is the name of the article but it's people on Ravelry reference that article a lot but it explains all the different ways that stitches can look and why they look that way um let's see please talk about st sticking reinforcing and picking up stitches on the sticked edge I um I have learned how to steak, but I have never done a project that does that. So there's a few different ways of doing it, and that's going to depend on the kind of yarn that you're using, what which method you want to use, and also what sorts of tools are available to you. So I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. But um, there are a lot of people in my Ravelry group who do that kind of thing. So if you ask in my Ravelry group, a lot of times I try to answer every question as best I can. And sometimes my, my answer is, I don't know, I'm not the best person, but there's always uh, people who will say, oh, we'll try this or do this or do this and, and they'll have experience with that. How often do I fudge things when following a pattern and make a mistake? Or are you particular about going back and fixing it? Uh, I will fix things if I notice. So I, and I don't always notice. So if everything is still on the needles and I see that it was something, you know, a ways down, I will, if it's a miscross cable, something like that, I will often um, go back and fix it. But I just, let me, I'll show you one other thing. When I finished the back of my Erin sweater, uh, I was looking at it, and I, um, well, let's see if I can even find it. I, I, it was immediately obvious to me when I first saw it. Oh, here it is. So I was looking at it, and um, let's see if you can see, there is a mist crust cable right here 
um, it, this cable goes all the way on top and it should have crossed under. I was already all the way up here. It's on the back by my underarm. I'm not going to fix that. So um, sometimes it's really hard when it's right on the needles and you see it and you're like, oh my gosh, um, and you're not seeing it in the context of the entire thing. Um, so um, usually if it's off the needles, um, I had a friend in a knitting group who gave me some good advice once when I finished a sweater. I'd done all this neck shaping and I bound off the, the sleeves and I realized I'd forgotten something right here. It was like a yarn over that I'd forgotten. There was like a little diamond cable pattern and there was a yarn over on each side and I'd forgotten one of them. And, and, she, and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And she said, just live with it for a week. Wear the sweater <laughs> a couple times and see in a week if it still bothers you. And um, and it didn't. So I, I tend to forget about it and it just doesn't bother me. So it just really depends on what kind of, of an error is. Um, I do fix things though. If I, see, if I see a mistake and I notice it, I absolutely will fix it. Let's see. I've had an angled ladder when going down to fix a stitch that looked off, one end of ladder appeared to be from row above on one side. Uh, that, that can happen. And it, sometimes it, uh, especially if there's a, a yarn over that's adjacent to it, then that can mess it up. But sometimes, yeah, sometimes you are using the wrong um, strand. But if it's only on one side versus the other, um, it, it could be that there was some sort of a, a yarn over or other kind of increase or something. I've, I've noticed that and I remember seeing that within the past few months and trying to figure out what was causing it. So without seeing exactly what was going on. Um, but other times it's because um, I, I've laddered down, I've got all these strands and I and I pick up the wrong one. I pick up not the bottom one, but the next one up and they get reversed. Um, so that, that can happen um, as well. Question, is it possible to knit a saddle shoulder of a sweater bottom up? Yes, I've been looking everywhere and most places only show top down. Um, yeah, yeah, you can do it. Um, at, and you can also do a hybrid of it. Like um, the sweater I did for the Master Hand Knitting Program for a level three was an Aran sweater I knit for my husband. I did the body bottom up and left the stitches live. And then I started um, the saddle at the neck. And as I was knitting the saddle, I was joining in a stitch on each side. And then I, I did the sleeves top, top down. But you could do that um, bottom up as well. I'm trying to think of, um, I assume that this Ann Bud book, because these are all bottom up, um, I think she has saddle saddle shoulder sweaters so uh, this is saddle shoulder so it, it, it may also depend on whether you want to seam it in or, or join things live because they could be that could be another option as well but this book is going to um, be able to do that for you uh, let's see question in order to use Kofi to make a contribution do I have to make an account or is there you can do it I get a lot of uh, Kofi for don't if you don't know it's the this website where it's buy me a coffee on Kofi and you can and the coffee amount is three dollars so you could buy me one coffee or ten coffees or you can if, if you want to do a monthly contribution some people do that then you have to sign in um, but I get a lot of, of contributions like someone sees a video that really helped them on their project and so when they just as a thank you for that particular video they uh, will buy me a coffee and it, and I get a message but it just says someone likes loves what you do is, and, and I don't have a message. I think if you want to leave a message like tell me specifically something I think you might have to create a login um, but you can do it without um, without creating a login. Hi Kim from the UK. Um, let's see. 
what is my preferred method for closing the gap when joining in the round? Uh, I've done a video on this called, I think it's called Jogless Join in the Round or Jogless Cast On in the Round, something like that. And so I show uh, the method that I use for long tail cast on, uh, how I join and then how I weave in the end. Uh, and it's really, uh, I think the two things that are really important in that is not using a slip knot, but simply starting um, the cast on with a, a twisted loop. Uh, and then you just um, knit, uh, knit to that first stitch that's only a twisted loop. It's not like all of the other ones. You knit that first one and now you have created a twisted loop with a knit stitch like all of the other ones. And that stitch becomes the last stitch of the round. And then that yarn tail that's hanging there um, can be easily pulled to tighten and it's um, the way you weave it in is, uh, is to join that end of the round to the beginning of the round in a way that just duplicates, uh, duplicates um, the edge and you can't see where it is. So that's my favorite method. It's kind of a, a three-step process. A lot of people know and have, have used one or other of those processes, but it's kind of putting all three of them together. But I believe it's called... Uh, jog, jogless cast on in the round or jogless long tail cast on in the round, something like that. Um, and I also, I think I also did one for cable cast on too, that to make it so that um, it's very even. And there's a video for um, binding off in the round so that that chain is just continuous all the way around as well. There's if if you can't find it by title the title there should be a playlist called like cast ons or bind offs or something like that that you should be able to um, find the video that way. Should I knit or should you knit on the tips or the barrel of the needles? Well, I can switch this other camera and kind of show you uh, what I think. Let me put these books down. That was loud. Um, let's see, let me do this overhead thing. So, get my cord out of the way too, get my hands in the right place. Okay, so I usually am working pretty close to the taper. Um, and so I am keeping my needles uh, perpendicular while I'm uh, grabbing the yarn. So I'm pretty so by the time I'm pulling the yarn through, I am on the taper and I'm pushing the needle off. And at the same time, my thumb is putting the, pushing the next stitch on getting to be ready. So this is my uh, continental method. Um, so the problem with working uh, too far down the barrel is that you have to get the stitch off. And a lot of people end up pulling it off and that ends up introducing extra slack in here. Um, so, but one of the things I do, you, you'll see how far, uh, you know, I've got it down here um, because I do want it to be around the full um, thickness of the needle. I don't want it, I don't want my, my stitch to end up on the right hand needle right up here because then they'll get tight and then I won't be able to get them on the needle. So if you hold the yarn in your right hand, now this is not my normal way of knitting with it in my right hand, but uh, it's the same thing. I keep my needle um, perpendicular and I, my needles are touching each other and it, it's, I, I'm just coming around the front and then I'm pushing off and again I'm pushing up toward here. So I'm constantly feeding um, the next stitch up as this one is getting pushed off. Okay, let's go back to there. Okay, um, talked about weaving in the ends in Antarsha. I was also wondering if you have a how to weave in your ends with stranded color work. It's hard to see the stitches with the strands in the way. Yeah, I don't do it the same way. I, I do it, um, uh, you can't really do that reverse duplicate stitch because those strands are in the way. So what I typically do is I have a sharper needle. I don't use my bent needle so much. Um, I use a little bit sharper needle and I, I'm, I'm piercing through the backs of, this, of the strands. 
and I usually go, you know, a couple of different directions um, for that um, because it's really otherwise it's you're you're pulling the strands apart trying to to see where the backs of the stitches are and that just does not work uh, very well. Um, a lot of people who knit with this woolen spun yarn that's very sticky, they don't even weave in their ends because they just they, over time they'll they'll felt in. And another thing that people can do sometimes with stranded color work. If you're using 100% wool um, and you maybe you have that little jog at the beginning end of the round where you're transitioning from one color to another, especially with true fair allen knitting where the background and foreground colors are shifting constantly, you could just uh, spit felt the ends together and you know the pattern is just going to gradually transition from, from one color to the other. So that's another option to get rid of ends so you don't have to weave them in. Um, I question, I made my first spreadsheet for a mosaic shawl I'm knitting. Can you tell me how to insert data for the rows that are repeated? Um, well, you could just say that it was two rows. And so that'll calculate, it'll multiply out the total number of stitches if that's what you're looking for. If you're just looking for stitch counts, the, the spreadsheet that I did... Um, a week, couple of weeks ago, every row, there was only one row that was worked like that because it was a decreasing every row. Um, but if you have like 10 rows that are all the same, you could just say that there are 10 rows and we'll calculate the number of stitches. Um, or you could just, you know, insert a row in there and, and use the same data. I do things uh, differently for different kinds of projects. And, you know, if there's color work involved versus cables versus shaping, I add the things that I want. So it depends on what, what that data is that you're, that you're looking for. Um, let's see. You love it. Let's see. What's been your favorite thing to watch in the background when you knit? I really like having a TV series with a lot of seasons. <laughs> because then I can just start and it will just keep playing one after the other. And then I don't have to look for something to watch. What I really hate is, you know, that if I get bored with it after a while, like maybe it's seven seasons and like, oh, okay, I'm, I want something else. I can spend a couple of days wasting time looking for something to watch. Um, this past uh, weekend, um, I have been watching um, old episodes of Bones. <laughs> I love that show. I saw I saw from the beginning to the end, and I've watched every show multiple times. And it's sort of like a a comfort show for me. And it's kind of like what I'm in the mood for right now. Like I've been knitting socks this weekend. It just it's like a comfortable knit for me, and I want a comfortable. A show um, that I don't that I, I know what's going to happen I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now and it's like I, I want to at least be sure what is going to happen in the TV show um, for my birthday I got BritBox uh, as a, a subscription to BritBox I already have a subscription to Acorn TV so there was a, for a while I watched a lot of things on Acorn TV like um, there's a show from Australia I think they call it Doctor Doctor there, but on Acorn they call it the Heart Guy. I really like that show, but you know they only have like the problem with like these British shows is they have like six or eight episodes in a season, where like in the U.S. you might have like 22 episodes per season. So if there's you know 10 seasons, you've got hundreds of, of shows that that uh, you can watch. So um, that's what I've been watching lately. So. I don't like to. I don't like things where I have to actually pay attention. I was watching Agents of Shield a couple of years ago, and I was finishing up a blanket. I was doing a crochet edging around it, and I'm. I was, you know, not a good crocheter, and I thought I can't believe how long it's taking me to do this edging, and it was because it's such a plot intensive show that I was just stopping. I wasn't paying attention, so I had to put on something like forensic files that I didn't have to pay attention to, so I could um, just do that. I couldn't get spit felting to work despite watching your video and a lot of others. It just wouldn't stick. It's very grabby, 100% wool, designed to be felty. You have to press hard. Like your hands have to have to. 
when I was first learning to spit felt, I had that problem too. Like I was just, I was rubbing and my hands felt warm, but like they have to feel like you have to really push and they're going to feel hot. And sometimes what can really help is if you're wearing a pair of blue jeans or you have a towel or the arm of your sofa or something like that, doing it on that, um, so that you can really push down and you can get a sense of how hot it has to be, how wet it has to be, uh, how long you have to do it for. And I don't, uh, some wools are going to just, like, I can't tell you how many times I perfectly spit felt the two um, tails together and then realized that I had just spit felt the new ball to the cast on tail. <laughs> and those always seem to be perfectly felted together. But a lot of times, if you actually pulled on them, they're going to pull apart a little bit. The point is to have them stay together well enough so that as you're knitting, they'll stay together. Um, because if the tail, if it comes a little bit loose from, from each other, it's not going to fall apart as long as you have enough of an overlap. It'll, it'll stay together just like if you were actually weaving that tail in for three or four stitches. Question, do you, have you done a video on the ladder back jacquard, jacquard or jacquard uh, technique? I have not. I have purchased Susan Rainey's um, pattern, It's Not About the Hat, in which she does, she's got a system that she does. There are a few different ways of doing that. Uh, I don't do enough color work, and I really, when I do color work, I try to avoid things that have long spans. I mean, there's some, sometimes I can't, and I'll just trap by weaving, um, and that you get that little color blip on the front. Um, and I tend to just live with that uh, rather than, I think if I did more color work, um, I would be more invested in, in exploring those techniques, but I just, I don't, I tend to really focus more on cables. So for a spreadsheet with pieces that you have to seam together, like front, back, sleeves, oh, it's thunder. Um, how do you organize that on the spreadsheet? Uh, I start in the order in which I'm knitting. I have uh, one for the back. Uh, I, uh, I have all the stitch counts out for the back and the shaping. And usually uh, when I'm doing the neck shaping, I have to separate out the right front from uh, the left or the right shoulder from the left shoulder if I'm doing some shaping that's going to separate those two. Um, so whichever shoulder I do first, and then I do the next shoulder, and then I do everything for the front. And a lot of times I can copy a lot of what I did for the back to create the spreadsheet for the front because it's going to be the same up until the neck shaping. Um, and then for the sleeves, I'll do one sleeve uh, and just copy that for the second sleeve. So um, it's just, it's in order. It's one big long, uh, long thing in order, and then I'll, um, I total it all up. Sometimes I will total, I'll do a subtotal of the front, the back, and each sleeve so I can get a sense of um, how much, uh, what percentage each part is of the whole sweater. I usually know in general what that's going to be, but sometimes it gets a little more specific. Um, uh, how about audio? I just found out the BBC is 51 episodes of the boring talks. You know, I don't know. Is it something available in the U.S.? Because sometimes I'll go on the BBC website and they'll have something like for their TV and I can't look at it because I'm in the U.S. So, um, let's see. Have you been spinning lately? I'm spinning now as I watch. Very soothing. You know, I haven't. I started out this year <laughs> with good intentions, and I think, um, you know, I probably should do, uh, I'll probably do some more of it. I, I have finally come to terms with the fact that spinning has taught me a lot about yarn, but uh, I'm not probably going to be an obsessive spinner. Um, like, I want to know enough about it. Uh, to understand yarn better or to, and to figure out how things are constructed. I avoided learning to spin for so many years because I thought I'd be obsessive, but it's, I think it's sort of like crochet. It's like, I really want to know how it works, but I'm not that interested in, you know, devoting hours and hours. I love to knit. Um, and I think um, it's the same way, but I took a weaving class, a rigid heddle weaving class years ago when I was first living here in the Twin Cities. 
and um, I did my took the class, did my scarf, liked my scarf, and I'm like, well, that was interesting. Don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so, so I I I do use my wheel sometimes, um, but I. I'm not going to be a consistent spinner. I think I'm going to just be a, a an occasional spinner. Let's see. Oh, I someone said I, I might enjoy the TV series A Place to Call Home. I did watch that. I probably watched the first few um, seasons of it. And then I was like, oh my God. Like everything in the world, every catastrophe happens to this one group of five people of a uh, family of five is so so property and i loved it but i got to the point where i was like okay i've had enough and so then i had to move on to something else so i didn't really like that show though yeah the thunder it's probably a little darker in here too um do i have any techniques for designing i don't oh for designing cables um you mean like designing your own or designing with cables so it's kind of two different things so if i'm if i'm using um cables from a stitch dictionary then i will find things that i really like and i will chart them out together and see see what i think and then i knit up a swatch like the swatch is going to have every every case going to be like basically the middle center panel and everything that goes to the right or left of it and i see how they work together so when i was designing my erin sweater back in uh, november december of 2018 i did some videos on the design process and kind of showed what my swatches looked like from from iteration to iteration because that's a really it's a different skill set um to select cables that go together and i think over time you kind of get a sense of what might work and and what might not. Uh, when I did the the design for the Erin sweater I knit for the Master Hand Knitting Program, I had a particular element that I thought was tying everything together, and and I think it worked fine. But in some ways, I think it almost made it uh, less interesting than it could have been. So I think there's just sort of a knack to that, and it just takes practice. It's like everything. You just it takes practice and and trying things out and seeing what works. And and if you look at something, you're like, oh, I don't like the way that worked out. Um, you've learned something, and you keep the swatches, and you can you can see what works and what doesn't, and, and ideas. But if you're talking about uh, designing your own cables, I have done that occasionally. Um, sometimes I'll find a cable that I like and I just modify it a little bit differently in order to to work for the number of stitches or the number of rows that I want to work and I think it's just being really comfortable with cables and understanding how they work especially with traveling cables what are those little ropes that are uh, crossing back and forth you get a sense of how if something cro if a, one of the ropes crossed over the top uh, last time, then this time is going to cross under, so you get a sense of how that kind of weaving of the ropes works. Uh, but a lot of that is is knitting them and and observing how they work and getting a sense of those, and then then you can start designing with them. But it's sort of two different areas of designing with cables. Um, do I have a ball winder you recommend? I need to upgrade. You know, the ball winder I have, I love, and I don't think they make it anymore. It's uh, Royal. It was this blue one, and a lot of people had them. It's I've had it, I'm guessing, more than 10 years, somewhere between 10 and 15 years I've had it, and it works great. Um, but... I, I don't know what I don't know what the good sort of workhorse one is. I know there are a lot of uh, places that sell them, but they're kind of uh, not sturdy. So I really don't know. Um, any tips for a first stitch purl when dealing with loose edge tension? You knit mirror continental and first stitch purl is borderline impossible. Uh, I would say, um, 
wait until the second stitch to try to tighten things up and that's the kind of the advice I'd give if you were not a mirror knitter is that a lot of people have looser pearls and a lot of people have more rowing out at the beginning of, or end of rows um, and the rowing out tends to be looser. I used to have a, a trouble with rowing out on the pearl side but my stitches were too tight. Um, so um, you might even want to explore other ways to purl. I, when I am um, knitting Continental and I'm beginning a round um, and so the very first stitch is a purl, I don't use the same purl method that I use the rest of the round. I use a Norwegian purl. So I keep my yarn in the back, I do a Norwegian purl, then I move my yarn to the front, and then I purl the way I normally do. So I would experiment with other methods of purling if the way you normally purl doesn't work well at the beginning of the round. Um, let's see. I don't know if I missed something. Let's see. Um... I'm hoping I'm answered. What if my favorite thing to watch in the background? I already answered that. I think I've answered. If I've skipped anybody, I really I apologize. But if there's any more questions, ask them now. <laughs> um, um, but otherwise, I think we'll end it. We've been going for an hour. So thank you all uh, for joining me today. I have a lot of fun answering your questions. Oh, uh, one more. How do I choose a heel pattern that would suit someone with flat feet? If you're going to work from a formula, then you use a short row heel or a peasant heel. Uh, but any, and okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> There's certain types of heels that they say are suitable for people with flat feet, or these are good for people with high insteps. But what they're, what frequently gets ignored is how big is their ankle? relative to how tall their heel is. Because some people have flat feet, but they have a big ankle. And so the heel's going to be, uh, they're gonna have so many more stitches. And so the, the heel is going to be uh, roomy even if you're doing uh, a short row heel. So um, it, there's a little bit more to the proportions, but in general, a short row heel or a peasant heel work by the basic formula, which is you short row, however many stitches you have for your heel, you short row until you have about a third of them remaining, uh, and then you short row in the other direction. And if you're doing a peasant heel or afterthought heel, you'd be working in the round and decreasing until you were down to about a third of the stitches that you started with. And that's going to create a fairly shallow heel um, that is going to probably fit better um, than if you knit some other heel by formula, but you can always adjust any type of heel. So, you know, that's part of the thing with socks is that they tend to be designed by formula using starting with one measurement and, and basing everything, stitch counts, row counts, everything based on that one starting measurement and people's legs are not perfectly proportioned based on that one measurement. So I am going to say goodbye, and we'll probably do this again in another couple weeks. I think uh, Sunday afternoon seems to work uh, well. I, a lot of you joined from all different parts of the world. So thanks so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time.